Section 13 of A Book of Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. A Book of Myths by Jean Lang. Section 13 Perseus the Hero. We call such a man a hero in English to this day, and call it a heroic thing to suffer pain and grief that we may do good to our fellow men. Charles Kingsley In the pleasant land of Argos, now a place of unwholesome marshes, once upon a time there reigned a king called Acrisius, the father of one fair daughter. Danae was her name and she was very dear to the king until a day when he longed to know what lay hid for him in the lap of the gods and consulted an oracle with hanging head he returned from the temple for the oracle had told him that when his daughter danae had borne a son by the hand of that son death must surely come upon him and because the fear of death was in him more strong than the love of his daughter acrisius resolved that by sacrificing her he would baffle the gods and frustrate death itself a great tower of brass was speedily built at his command and in this prison danae was placed to drag out her weary days but who can escape the designs of the gods from olympus great zeus himself looked down and saw the fair princess sighing away her youth and full of pity and of love he himself entered the brazen tower in a golden shower and danae became the bride of zeus and happily passed with him the time of her imprisonment to her at length was born a son a beautiful and kingly child and great was the wrath of her father when he had tidings of the birth did the gods in the high heavens laugh at him the laugh should yet be on his side down to the seashore he hurried danae and her newly born babe the little perseus put them in a great chest and set them adrift to be a plaything for winds and waves and a prey for the cruel and hungry sea when in the cunningly wrought chest the raging blast and the stirred billow and terror fell upon her with tearful cheeks she cast her arm around perseus and spake alas my child what sorrow is mine but thou slumberest in baby wise sleeping in this woeful ark midst the darkness of the brazen rivet thou shinest and in the swart gloom sent forth thou heedest not the deep foam of the passing wave above thy locks nor the voice of the blast as thou liest in thy purple covering a sweet face if terror had terrors for thee and thou art giving ear to my gentle words i bid thee sleep my babe and may the sea sleep and our measureless woe and may change of fortune come forth father zeus from thee for i make my prayer in boldness and beyond right forgive me simonidas of chaos for days and nights the mother and child were tossed on the billows but yet no harm came near them and one morning the chest grounded on the rocky beach of seraphos an island in the aegean sea here a fisherman came on this strange flotsam and jetsam of the waves and took the mother and child to polydectes the king and the years that followed were peaceful years for danae and for perseus but as perseus grew up growing each day more goodly to look upon more fearless more ready to gaze with serene courage into the eyes of gods and of men an evil thing befell his mother she was but a girl when he was born and as the years passed she grew ever more fair and the crafty eyes of old polydectes the king ever watched her more eagerly always more hotly desired her for his wife but danae the beloved of zeus himself had no wish to wed the old king of the cyclades and proudly she scorned his suit behind her as she knew well was the stout arm of her son perseus and while perseus was there the king could do her no harm but perseus 
unwitting of the danger his mother daily had to face, sailed the seas unfearingly, and felt that peace and safety surrounded him on every side. At Samos one day, while his ship was lading, Perseus lay down under the shade of a great tree, and soon his eyelids grew heavy with sleep, and there came to him, like butterflies that flit over the flowers in a sunlit garden, pleasant, light-winged dreams. But yet another dream followed close on the merry heels of those that went before. And before Perseus there stood one whose grey eyes were as the fathomless sea on the dawn of a summer day. Her long robes were blue as the hyacinths in spring, and the spear that she held in her hand was of a polished brightness as the dart with which the gods smite the heart of a man with joy inexpressible, with sorrow that is scarcely to be borne. To Perseus she spoke winged words. I am Pallas Athena, she said, and to me the souls of men are known. Those whose fat hearts are as those of the beasts that perish do I know. They live at ease. No bitter sorrow is theirs, nor any fierce joy that lifts their feet free from the cumbering clay. But dear to my heart are the souls of those whose tears are tears of blood, whose joy is as the joy of the immortals. Pain is theirs, and sorrow. Disappointment is theirs, and grief. Yet their love is as the love of those who dwell on Olympus. Patient they are, and long-suffering, and ever they hope, ever do they trust. Ever they fight, fearless and unashamed. And when the sum of their days on earth is accomplished, wings of whose existence they have never had knowledge bear them upwards, out of the mist and din and strife of life, to the life that has no ending. Then she laid her hand on the hand of Perseus. Perseus, she said, art thou of those whose dull souls forever dwell in pleasant ease, or wouldst thou be as one of the immortals? And in his dream Perseus answered without hesitation, Rather let me die a youth, living my life to the full, fighting ever, suffering ever, he said, than live at ease like a beast that feeds on flowery pastures, and knows no fiery gladness, no heart-bleeding pain. Then Pallas Athena, laughing for joy because she loved so well a hero's soul, showed him a picture that made even his brave heart sick for dread, and told him a terrible story. In the dim, cold far west, she said, there lived three sisters. One of them, Medusa, had been one of her priestesses, golden-haired and most beautiful. But when Athena found that she was as wicked as she was lovely, swiftly had she meted out a punishment. Every lock of her golden hair had been changed into a venomous snake. Her eyes, that had once been the cradles of love, were turned into love's stony tombs. Her rosy cheeks were now of death's own livid hue. Her smile, which drew the hearts of lovers from their bosoms, had become a hideous thing. A grinning mask looked on the world, and to the world her gaping mouth and protruding tongue meant a horror before which the world stood terrified, dumb. There are some sadnesses too terrible for human hearts to bear. So it came to pass that in the dark cavern in which she dwelt, and in the shadowy woods around it, all living things that had met the awful gaze of her hopeless eyes were turned into stone. Then Pallas Athena showed Perseus, mirrored in a brazen shield, the face of one of the tragic things of the world. And as Perseus looked, his soul grew chill within him. But when Athena, in low voice, asked him, Perseus, wilt even end the sorrow of this piteous sinful one? He answered, Even that will I do, the gods helping me. And Pallas Athena, smiling again in glad content, left him to dream. And Perseus awoke in sudden fear, and found that in truth he had but dreamed, yet held his dream, as a holy thing in the secret treasure-house of his heart. Back to Seraphos he sailed, and found that his mother walked in fear of Polydectes the king. She told her son, a strong man now, though young in years, the story of his cruel persecution. 
Perseus saw red blood, and gladly would he have driven his keen blade far home in the heart of Polydectes. But his vengeance was to be a great vengeance, and the vengeance was delayed. The king gave a feast, and on that day everyone in the land brought offerings of their best and most costly to do him honor. Perseus alone came empty-handed, and as he stood in the king's court as though he were a beggar, the other youths mocked at him, of whom they had ever been jealous. "'Thou sayest that thy father is one of the gods,' they said. "'Where is thy godlike gift, O Perseus?' And Polydectes, glad to humble the lad who was keeper of his mother's honour, echoed their foolish taunt. "'Where is the gift of the gods that the noble son of the gods has brought me?' he asked. And his fat cheeks and loose mouth quivered with ugly merriment. Then Perseus, his head thrown back, gazed in the bold eyes of Polydectes. Son of Zeus he was indeed, as he looked with royal scorn at those whom he despised. "'A godlike gift thou shalt have, in truth, O king,' he said. And his voice rang out as a trumpet call before the battle. "'The gift of the gods shall be thine. The gods helping me, thou shalt have the head of Medusa.' A laugh, half-born, died in the throats of Polydectes and of those who listened. And Perseus strode out of the palace a glow in his heart, for he knew that Pallas Athena had lit the fire that burned in him now, and that though he should shed the last drop of his life's blood to win what he sought, right would triumph, and wrong must be worsted. Still quivering with anger, Perseus went down to the blue sea that gently whispered its secrets to the shore on which he stood. If Pallas Athena would but come, he thought, if only my dreams might come true. For, like many a boy before and since, Perseus had dreamed of gallant, fearless deeds. Like many a boy before and since, he had been the hero of a great adventure. So he prayed, Come to me, I pray you, Pallas Athena, come, and let me dream true. His prayer was answered. Into the sky there came a little silver cloud that grew and grew, and ever it grew nearer. And then, as in his dream, Pallas Athena came to him and smiled on him as the sun smiles on the water in spring. Nor was she alone. Beside her stood Hermes of the winged shoes, and Perseus knelt before the two in worship. Then, very gently, Pallas Athena gave him counsel and more than counsel she gave. In his hand she placed a polished shield, than which no mirror shone more brightly. Do not look at Medusa herself, look only on her image here reflected. Then strike home hard and swiftly, and when her head is severed, wrap it in the goatskin on which the shield hangs. So wilt thou return in safety and in honour. But how, then, shall I cross the wet grey fields of this watery way? asked Perseus. Would that I were a white-winged bird that skims across the waves. And, with the smile of a loving comrade, Hermes laid his hand on the shoulder of Perseus. My winged shoes shall be thine, he said, and the white-winged sea-birds shalt thou leave far, far behind. Yet another gift is thine, said Athena. Gird on, as gift from the gods, this sword that is immortal. For a moment Perseus lingered. May I not bid farewell to my mother, he asked. May I not offer burnt offerings to thee and to Hermes and to my father Zeus himself? But Athena said nay. At his mother's weeping his heart might relent, and the offering that the Olympians desired was the head of Medusa. Then, like a fearless young golden eagle, Perseus spread out his arms, and the winged shoes carried him across the seas to the cold northern lands whither Athena had directed him. Each day his shoes took him a seven days' journey, and ever the air through which he passed grew more chill, till at length he reached the land of everlasting snow, where the black ice never knows the conquering warmth of spring, and where the white surf of the moaning waves freezes solid 
even as it touches the shore it was a dark grim place to which he came and in a gloomy cavern by the sea lived the greia the three grey sisters that athena had told him he must seek old and grey and horrible they were with but one tooth amongst them and but one eye from hand to hand they passed the eye and muttered and shivered in the blackness and the cold boldly perseus spoke to them and asked them to guide him to the place where medusa and her sisters the gorgons dwelt no others know where they dwell he said tell me i pray thee the way that i may find them but the grey women were kin to the gorgons and hated all the children of men and ugly was their evil mirth as they mocked at perseus and refused to tell him where medusa might be found but perseus grew wily in his desire not to fail and as the eye passed from one withered clutching hand to another he held out his own strong young palm and in her blindness one of the three placed the eye within it then the grey women gave a piteous cry fierce and angry as the cry of old grey wolves that have been robbed of their prey and gnashed upon him with their toothless jaws and perseus said wicked ye are and cruel at heart and blind shall ye remain for ever unless ye tell me where i may find the gorgons but tell me that and i give back the eye then they whimpered and begged of him and when they found that all their beseeching was in vain at length they told him go south they said so far south that at length thou comest to the uttermost limits of the sea to the place where the day and night meet there is the garden of the hesperides and of them must thou ask the way and give us back our eye they wailed again most piteously and perseus gave back the eye into a greedy trembling old hand and flew south like a swallow that is glad to leave the gloomy frozen lands behind to the garden of the hesperides he came at last and amongst the myrtles and roses and sunny fountains he came on the nymphs who there guard the golden fruit and begged them to tell him whither he must wing his way in order to find the gorgons but the nymphs could not tell we must ask atlas they said the giant who sits high up on the mountain and with his strong shoulders keeps the heavens and earth apart and with the nymphs perseus went up the mountain and asked the patient giant to guide him to the place of his quest far away i can see them said atlas on an island in the great ocean but unless thou wert to wear the helmet of pluto himself thy going must be in vain what is this helmet asked perseus and how can i gain it didst thou wear the helmet of the ruler of dark places thou wouldst be as invisible as a shadow in the blackness of night answered atlas but no mortal can obtain it for only the immortals can brave the terrors of the shadowy land and yet return yet if thou wilt promise me one thing the helmet shall be thine what wouldst thou asked perseus and atlas said for many a long year i have borne this earth and i grow aweary of my burden when thou hast slain medusa let me gaze upon her face that i may be turned into stone and suffer no more for ever and perseus promised and at the bidding of atlas one of the nymphs sped down to the land of the shades and for seven days perseus and her sisters awaited her return her face was as the face of a white lily and her eyes were dark with sadness when she came but with her she bore the helmet of pluto and when she and her sisters had kissed perseus and bidden him a sorrowful farewell he put on the helmet and vanished away soon the gentle light of day had gone and he found himself in a place where clammy fog blotted out all things and where the sea was black as the water of that stream that runs through the cocytus valley and in that silent land where there is neither night nor day nor cloud nor breeze nor storm 
he found the cave of horrors in which the gorgons dwelt two of them like monstrous swine lay asleep but a third woman paced about the hall and ever turned her head from wall to wall and moaned aloud and shrieked in her despair because the golden tresses of her hair were moved by writhing snakes from side to side that in their writhing oftentimes would glide onto her breast or shuddering shoulders white or falling down the hideous things would light upon her feet and crawling thence would twine their slimy folds upon her ankles fine william morris in the shield of pallas athena the picture was mirrored and as perseus gazed on it his soul grew heavy for the beauty and the horror of medusa and oh that it had been her foul sisters that i must slay he thought at first but then to slay her will be kind indeed he said her beauty has become corruption and all the joy of life for her has passed into the agony of remembrance the torture of unending remorse and when he saw her brazen claws that still were greedy and lustful to strike and to slay his face grew stern and he paused no longer but with his sword he smote her neck with all his might and main and to the rocky floor the body of medusa fell with brazen clang but her head he wrapped in the goatskin while he turned his eyes away aloft then he sprang and flew swifter than an arrow from the bow of diana with hideous outcry the two other gorgons found the body of medusa and like foul vultures that hunt a little songbird they flew in pursuit of perseus for many a league they kept up the chase and their howling was grim to hear across the seas they flew and over the yellow sand of the libyan desert and as perseus flew before them some blood drops fell from the severed head of medusa and from them bred the vipers that are found in the desert to this day but bravely did the winged shoes of hermes bear perseus on and by nightfall the gorgon sisters had passed from sight and perseus found himself once more in the garden of the hesperides ere he sought the nymphs he knelt by the sea to cleanse from his hands medusa's blood and still does the seaweed that we find on sea beaches after a storm bear the crimson stains and when perseus had received glad welcome from the fair dwellers in the garden of the hesperides he sought atlas that to him he might fulfil his promise and eagerly atlas beheld him for he was aweary of his long toil so perseus uncovered the face of medusa and held it up for the titan to gaze upon and when atlas looked upon her whose beauty had once been pure and living as that of a flower in spring and saw only anguish and cruelty foul wickedness and hideous despair his heart grew like stone within him to stone too turned his great patient face and into stone grew his vast limbs and strong crouching back so did atlas the titan become atlas the mountain and still his head white crowned with snow and his great shoulder far up in misty clouds would seem to hold apart the earth and the sky then perseus again took flight and in his flight he passed over many lands and suffered weariness and want and sometimes felt his faith growing low yet ever he sped on hoping ever enduring ever in egypt he had rest and was fed and honored by the people of the land who were fain to keep him to be one of their gods and in a place called chemis they built a statue of him when he had gone and for many hundreds of years it stood there and the egyptians said that ever and again perseus returned and that when he came the nile rose high and the season was fruitful because he had blessed their land far down below him as he flew one day he saw something white on a purple rock in the sea it seemed too large to be a snowy plumaged bird and he darted swiftly downward that he might see more clearly the spray lashed against the steep rocks of the desolate island and showered itself upon a figure that at first he took to be a statue of white marble the figure was but that of a girl slight and very youthful 
yet more fair even than any of the nymphs of the hesperides invisible in his helmet of darkness perseus drew near and saw that the fragile white figure was shaken by shivering sobs the waves every few moments lapped up on her little cold white feet and he saw that heavy chains held her imprisoned to that chilly rock in the sea a great anger stirred the heart of perseus and swiftly he took the helmet from his head and stood beside her the maid gave a cry of terror but there was no evil thing in the face of perseus naught but strength and kindness and purity shone out of his steady eyes thus when very gently he asked her what was the meaning of her cruel imprisonment she told him the piteous story as a little child tells the story of its grief to the mother who comforts it her mother was queen of ethiopia she said and very very beautiful but when the queen had boasted that no nymph who played amongst the snow-crested billows of the sea was as fair as she a terrible punishment was sent to her all along the coast of her father's kingdom a loathsome sea monster came to hold its sway and hideous were its ravages men and women children and animals all were equally desirable food for its insatiate maw and the whole land of ethiopia lay in mourning because of it at last her father the king had consulted an oracle that he might find help to rid the land of the monster and the oracle had told him that only when his fair daughter andromeda had been sacrificed to the creature that scourged the sea coast would the country go free thus had she been brought there by her parents that one life might be given for many and that her mother's broken heart might expiate her sin of vanity even as andromeda spoke the sea was broken by the track of a creature that cleft the water as does the forerunning gale of a mighty storm and andromeda gave a piteous cry lo he comes she cried save me ah save me i am so young to die then perseus darted high above her and for an instant hung poised like a hawk that is about to strike then like the hawk that cannot miss its prey swiftly did he swoop down and smote with his sword the devouring monster of the ocean not once but again and again he smote until all the water round the rock was churned into slime and blood-stained froth and until his loathsome combatant floated on its back mere carrion for the scavengers of the sea then perseus hewed off the chains that held andromeda and in his arms he held her tenderly as he flew with her to her father's land who so grateful then as the king and queen of ethiopia and who so happy as andromeda for perseus her deliverer dearest and greatest hero to her in all the world not only had given her her freedom but had given her his heart willingly and joyfully her father agreed to give her to perseus for his wife no marriage feast so splendid had ever been held in ethiopia in the memory of man but as it went on an angry man with a band of sullen-faced followers strode into the banqueting hall it was phineas he who had been betrothed to andromeda yet who had not dared to strike a blow for her rescue straight at perseus they rushed and fierce was the fight that then began but of a sudden from the goatskin where it lay hid perseus drew forth the head of medusa and phineas and his warriors were turned into stone for seven days the marriage feast lasted but on the eighth night pallas athena came to perseus in a dream nobly and well hast thou played the hero o son of zeus she said but now that thy toil is near an end and thy sorrows have ended in joy i come to claim the shoes of hermes the helmet of pluto the sword and the shield that is mine own yet the head of the gorgon must thou yet guard a while for i would have it laid in my temple at seraphos that i may wear it on my shield for evermore as she ceased to speak perseus awoke and lo the shield and helmet and the sword and winged shoes were gone so that he knew that his dream was no false vision then did perseus and andromeda 
in a red proud galley made by cunning craftsmen from phoenicia sail away westward until at length they came to the blue water of the aegean sea and saw rising out of the waves before them the rocks of seraphos and when the rowers rested on their long oars and the red proud ship ground on the pebbles of the beach perseus and his bride sought danae the fair mother of perseus black grew the brow of the son of danae when she told him what cruel things she had suffered in his absence from the hands of polydectes the king straight to the palace perseus strode and there found the king and his friends at their revels for seven years had perseus been away and now it was no longer a stripling who stood in the palace hall but a man in stature and bearing like one of the gods polydectes alone knew him and from his wine he looked up with mocking gaze so thou hast returned o nameless son of a deathless god he said thou didst boast but methinks thy boast was an empty one but even as he spoke the jeering smile froze on his face and the faces of those who sat with him stiffened in horror o king perseus said i swore that the gods helping me thou shouldst have the head of medusa the gods have helped me behold the gorgon's head wild horror in their eyes polydectes and his friends gazed on the unspeakable thing and as they gazed they turned into stone a ring of grey stones that still sit on a hillside of seraphos with his wife and his mother perseus then sailed away for he had a great longing to take danae back to the land of her birth and to see if her father acrisus still lived and might not now repent of his cruelty to her and to his grandson but there he found that the sins of acrisius had been punished and that he had been driven from his throne and his own land by a usurper not for long did the sword of perseus dwell in its scabbard and speedily was the usurper cast forth and all the men of argos acclaimed perseus as their glorious king but perseus would not be their king i go to seek acrisius he said my mother's father is your king again his galley sailed away and at last up the long euboean sea they came to the town of larissa where the old king now dwelt a feast and sports were going on when they got there and beside the king of the land sat acrisius an aged man yet a kingly one indeed and perseus thought if i a stranger take part in the sports and carry away prizes from the men of larissa surely the heart of acrisius must soften towards me thus did he take off his helmet and cuirass and stood unclothed beside the youths of larissa and so godlike was he that they all said amazed surely this stranger comes from olympus and is one of the immortals in his hand he took a discus and full five fathoms beyond those of the others he cast it and a great shout arose from those who watched and acrisius cried out as loudly as all the rest further still they cried further still canst thou hurl thou art a hero indeed and perseus putting forth all his strength hurled once again and the discus flew from his hand like a bolt from the hand of zeus the watchers held their breath and made ready for a shout of delight as they saw it speed on further than mortal man had ever hurled before but joy died in their hearts when a gust of wind caught the discus as it sped and hurled it against acrisius the king and with a sigh like the sigh that passes through the leaves of a tree as the woodman fells it and it crashes to the earth so did acrisius fall and lie prone to his side rushed perseus and lifted him tenderly in his arms but the spirit of acrisius had fled and with a great cry of sorrow perseus called to the people behold me i am perseus grandson of the man i have slain who can avoid the decree of the gods for many a year thereafter perseus reigned as king and to him and to his fair wife were born four sons and three daughters wisely and well he reigned and when at a good old age 
death took him and the wife of his heart the gods who had always held him dear took him up among the stars to live forever and ever and there still on clear and starry nights we may see him holding the gorgon's head near him are the father and mother of andromeda cepheus and cassiopeia and close behind him stands andromeda with her white arms spread out across the blue sky as in the days when she stood chained to the rock and those who sail the watery ways look up for guidance to one whose voyaging is done and whose warfare is accomplished and take their bearings from the constellation of cassiopeia end of perseus the hero recording by james k white chula vista section fourteen of a book of myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. A Book of Myths by Jean Lang. Section 14. Niobe. Like Niobe, all tears. Shakespeare. The quotation is an overworked quotation, like many another of those from Hamlet yet have half of those whose lips utter it more than the vaguest acquaintance with the story of niobe and the cause of her tears the noble group attributed to praxiteles of niobe and her last remaining child in the uffizi palace at florence has been so often reproduced that it also has helped to make the anguished figure of the theban queen a familiar one in pictorial tragedy so that as long as the works of those titans of art shakespeare and praxiteles endure no other monument is wanted for the memory of niobe like many of the tales of mythology her tragedy is a story of vengeance wreaked upon a mortal by an angry god she was the daughter of tantalus and her husband was amphion king of thebes himself a son of zeus to her were born seven fair daughters and seven beautiful and gallant sons and it was not because of her own beauty nor her husband's fame nor their proud descent and the greatness of their kingdom that the queen of thebes was arrogant in her pride very sure she was that no woman had ever borne children like her own children whose peers were not to be found on earth nor in heaven even in our own day there are mortal mothers who feel as niobe felt but amongst the immortals there was also a mother with children whom she counted as peerless latona mother of apollo and diana was magnificently certain that in all time nor in eternity to come could there be a son and daughter so perfect in beauty in wisdom and in power as the two that were her own loudly did she proclaim her proud belief and when niobe heard it she laughed in scorn the goddess has a son and a daughter she said beautiful and wise and powerful they may be but i have borne seven daughters and seven sons and each son is more than the peer of apollo each daughter more than the equal of diana the moon goddess and to her boastful words latona gave ear and anger began to grow in her heart each year the people of thebes were wont to hold a great festival in honor of latona and her son and daughter and it was an evil day for niobe when she came upon the adoring crowd that laurel crowned bore frankincense to lay before the altars of the gods whose glories they had assembled together to celebrate oh foolish ones she said and her voice was full of scorn am i not greater than latona i am the daughter of a goddess my husband the king the son of a god am i not fair am i not queenly as latona herself and of a surety i am richer by far than the goddess who has but one daughter and one son look on my seven noble sons behold the beauty of my seven daughters and see if they in beauty and all else do not equal the dwellers in olympus 
and when the people looked and shouted aloud for in truth niobe and her children were like unto gods their queen said do not waste thy worship my people rather make the prayers to thy king and to me and to my children who buttress us round and make our strength so great that fearlessly we can despise the gods in her home on the cynthian mountain top latona heard the arrogant words of the queen of thebes and even as a gust of wind blows smouldering ashes into a consuming fire her growing anger flamed into rage she called apollo and diana to her and commanded them to avenge the blasphemous insult which had been given to them and to their mother and the twin gods listened with burning hearts truly shalt thou be avenged cried apollo the shameless one shall learn that not unscathed goes she who profanes the honour of the mother of the deathless gods and with their silver bows in their hands apollo the smiter from afar and diana the virgin huntress hasted to thebes there they found all the noble youths of the kingdom pursuing their sports some rode some were having chariot races and excelling in all things were the seven sons of niobe apollo lost no time a shaft from his quiver flew as flies a bolt from the hand of zeus and the first-born of niobe fell like a young pine broken by the wind on the floor of his winning chariot his brother who followed him went on the heels of his comrade swiftly down to the shades two of the other sons of niobe were wrestling together their great muscles moving under the skin of white satin that covered their perfect bodies and as they gripped each other yet another shaft was driven from the bow of apollo and both lads fell joined by one arrow on the earth and there breathed their lives away their elder brother ran to their aid and to him too came death swift and sure the two youngest even as they cried for mercy to an unknown god were hurried after them by the unerring arrows of apollo the cries of those who watched this terrible slaying were not long in bringing niobe to the place where her sons lay dead yet even then her pride was unconquered and she defied the gods and latona to whose jealousy she ascribed the fate of her seven spears not yet hast thou conquered latona she cried my seven sons lie dead yet to me still remain the seven perfect lovelinesses that i have borne try to match them if thou canst with the beauty of thy two still am i richer than thou o cruel and envious mother of one daughter and one son but even as she spoke diana had drawn her bow and as the scythe of a mower quickly cuts down one after the other the tall white blossoms in the meadow so did her arrows slay the daughters of niobe when one only remained the pride of niobe was broken with her arms around the little slender frame of her golden-haired youngest born she looked up to heaven and cried upon all the gods for mercy she is so little she wailed so young so dear ah spare me one she said only one out of so many but the gods laughed like a harsh note of music sounded the twang of diana's bow pierced by a silver arrow the little girl lay dead the dignity of latona was avenged overwhelmed by despair king amphion killed himself and niobe was left alone to gaze on the ruin around her for nine days she sat a greek rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they were not on the tenth day the sight was too much even for the superhuman hearts of the gods to endure they turned the bodies into stone and themselves buried them and when they looked on the face of niobe and saw on it a bleeding anguish that no human hand could stay nor the word of any god comfort the gods were merciful her grief was immortalized for niobe at their will became a stone and was carried by a wailing tempest 
to the summit of mount sipolis in lydia where a spring of argos bore her name yet although a rock was niobe from her blind eyes of stone the tears still flowed a clear stream of running water symbol of a mother's anguish and never-ending grief end of niobe recording by james k white chula vista section 15 of a book of myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. A Book of Myths by Jean Lang. Section 15. Hyacinthus. The sad death of Hyacinthus, when the cruel breath of Zephyr slew him, Zephyr penitent, who now, ere Phoebus mounts the firmament, fondles the flower amid the sobbing rain. Keats. Whom the gods love die young, truly it would seem so as we read the old tales of men and of women beloved of the gods to those men who were deemed worthy of being companions of the gods seemingly no good fortune came yet after all if even in a brief span of life they had tasted god-given happiness was their fate one to be pitied rather let us keep our tears for those who in a colourless grey world have seen the dull days go past laden with trifling duties unnecessary cares and ever narrowing ideals and have reached old age and the grave no narrower than their lives without ever having known a fullness of happiness such as the olympians knew or ever having dared to reach upwards and to hold fellowship with the immortals hyacinthus was a spartan youth son of cleo one of the muses and of the mortal with whom she had mated and from mother or father or from the gods themselves he had received the gift of beauty it chanced one day that as apollo drove his chariot on its all-conquering round he saw the boy hyacinthus was as fair to look upon as the fairest of women yet he was not only full of grace but was muscular and strong as a straight young pine on mount olympus that fears not the blind rage of the north wind nor the angry tempests of the south when apollo had spoken with him he found that the face of hyacinthus did not belie the heart within him and gladly the god felt that at last he had found the perfect companion the ever courageous and joyous young mate whose mood was always ready to meet his own did apollo desire to hunt with merry shout hyacinthus called the hounds did the great god deign to fish hyacinthus was ready to fetch the nets and to throw himself whole-souled into the great affair of chasing and of landing the silvery fishes when apollo wished to climb the mountains to heights so lonely that not even the moving of an eagle's wing broke the everlasting stillness hyacinthus his strong limbs too perfect for the chisel of any sculptor worthily to reproduce was ready and eager for the climb and when on the mountain top apollo gazed in silence over illimitable space and watched the silver car of his sister diana rising slowly into the deep blue of the sky silvering land and water as she passed it was never hyacinthus who was the first to speak with words to break the spell of nature's perfect beauty shared in perfect companionship there were times too when apollo would play his lyre and when naught but the music of his own making could fulfil his longing and when those times came hyacinthus would lie at the feet of his friend of the friend who was a god and would listen with eyes of rapturous joy to the music that his master made a very perfect friend was this friend of the sun god nor was it apollo alone who desired the friendship of hyacinthus zephyrus god of the south wind had known him before apollo crossed his path and had eagerly desired him for a friend but who could stand against apollo sulkily zephyrus marked their ever ripening friendship and in his heart jealousy grew into hatred and hatred whispered to him 
of revenge. Hyacinthus excelled at all sports, and when he played quoits, it was sheer joy for Apollo, who loved all things beautiful, to watch him as he stood to throw the disc, his taut muscles making him look like Hermes, ready to spurn the cumbering earth from off his feet. Further even than the god, his friend, could Hyacinth throw, and always his merry laugh when he succeeded made the god feel that nor man nor god could ever grow old. And so there came that day, foreordained by the fates, when Apollo and Hyacinthus played a match together. Hyacinthus made a valiant throw, and Apollo took his place and cast the discus high and far. Hyacinthus ran forward, eager to measure the distance, shouting with excitement over a throw that had indeed been worthy of a god. Thus did Zephyrus gain his opportunity. Swiftly through the treetops ran the murmuring south wind, and smote the discus of Apollo with a cruel hand. Against the forehead of Hyacinthus it dashed, smiting the locks that lay upon it, crashing through skin and flesh and bone, felling him to the earth. Apollo ran towards him and raised him in his arms. But the head of Hyacinthus fell over on the god's shoulder like the head of a lily whose stem is broken. The red blood gushed to the ground, an unquenchable stream, and darkness fell on the eyes of Hyacinthus, and with the flow of his life's blood his gallant young soul passed away. Would that I could die for thee, Hyacinthus, cried the god, his god's heart near breaking. I have robbed thee of thy youth. Thine is the suffering, mine the crime. I shall sing thee ever, O perfect friend, and evermore shalt thou live as a flower that will speak to the hearts of men of spring, of everlasting youth, of life that lives forever. As he spoke, there sprang from the blood drops at his feet a cluster of flowers, blue as the sky in spring, yet hanging their heads as if in sorrow. And still when winter is ended, and the song of birds tell us of the promise of spring, if we go to the woods we find traces of the vow of the sun-god. The trees are budding in buds of rosy hue, the willow branches are decked with silvery catkins powdered with gold, the larches, like slender dryads, wear a feathery garb of tender green, and under the trees of the woods the primroses look up like fallen stars. Along the woodland path we go, treading on fragrant pine needles, and on the beech leaves of last year that have not yet lost their radiant amber. And at a turn of the way, the sun-god suddenly shines through the great dark branches of the giants of the forest, and before us lies a patch of exquisite blue, as though a god had robbed the sky, and torn from it a precious fragment that seems alive and moving between the sun and the shadow. And as we look, the sun caresses it, and the south wind gently moves the little bell-shaped flowers of the wild hyacinth as it softly sweeps across them. So does Hyacinthus live on. So do Apollo and Zephyrus still love and mourn their friend. End of Hyacinthus Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Section 16 of A Book of Myths This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. A Book of Myths by Jean Lang. Section 16. King Midas of the Golden Touch. In the plays of Shakespeare, we have three distinct divisions, three separate volumes. One deals with tragedy, another with comedy, a third with history. And a mistake made by the young in their aspect of life is that they do the same thing and keep tragedy and comedy severely apart, relegating them to separate volumes that, so they think, have nothing to do with each other. But those who have passed many milestones on the road know that history is the only right label for the book of life's many parts, 
and that the actors in the great play are in truth tragic comedians this is the story of midas one of the chief tragic comedians of mythology once upon a time the kingdom of phrygia lacked a king and in much perplexity the people sought help from an oracle the answer was very definite the first man who enters your city riding in a car shall be your king that day there came slowly jogging into the city in their heavy wooden-wheeled wain the peasant gordius and his wife and son whose destination was the marketplace and whose business was to sell the produce of their little farm and vineyard fowls a goat or two and a couple of skins full of strong purple-red wine an eager crowd awaited their entry and a loud shout of welcome greeted them and their eyes grew round and their mouths fell open in amaze when they were hailed as king and queen and prince of phrygia the gods had indeed bestowed upon gordius the low-born peasant a surprising gift but he showed his gratitude by dedicating his wagon to the deity of the oracle and tying it up in its place with the wiliest knot that his simple wisdom knew pulled as tight as his brawny arms and strong rough hands could pull nor could anyone untie the famous gordian knot and therefore become as the oracle promised lord of all asia until centuries had passed and alexander the great came to phrygia and sliced through the knot with his all-conquering sword in time midas the son of gordius came to inherit the throne and crown of phrygia like many another not born and bred to the purple his honors sat heavily upon him from the day that his father's wain had entered the city amidst the acclamations of the people he had learned the value of power and therefore from his boyhood onward power always more power was what he coveted also his peasant father had taught him that gold could buy power and so midas ever longed for more gold that could buy him a place in the world that no descendant of a long race of kings should be able to contest and from olympus the gods looked down and smiled and vowed that midas should have the chance of realizing his heart's desire therefore one day when he and his court were sitting in the solemn state that midas required there rode into their midst tipsily swaying on the back of a gentle full-fed old gray ass ivy-crowned jovial and foolish the satyr selenus guardian of the young god bacchus with all the deference due to the friend of a god midas treated this disreputable old pedagogue and for ten days and nights on end he feasted him royally on the eleventh day bacchus came in search of his preceptor and in deep gratitude bade midas demand of him what he would because he had done selenus honor when to dishonor him lay in his power not even for a moment did midas ponder i would have gold he said hastily much gold i would have that touch by which all common and valueless things become golden treasures and bacchus knowing that here spoke the son of peasants who many times had gone empty to bed after a day of toilful striving on the rocky uplands of phrygia looked a little sadly in the eager face of midas and answered be it as thou wilt thine shall be the golden touch then bacchus and selenus went away a rout of singing revellers at their heels and midas quickly put to proof the words of bacchus an olive tree grew near where he stood and from it he picked a little twig decked with leaves of softest gray and lo it grew heavy as he held it and glittered like a piece of his crown he stooped to touch the green turf on which some fragrant violets grew and turf grew into cloth of gold and violets lost their fragrance and became hard solid golden things he touched an apple whose cheek grew rosy in the sun and at once it became like the golden fruit in the garden of the hesperides the stone pillars of his palace as he brushed past them on entering blazed like a sunset sky the gods had not deceived him midas had the golden touch 
joyously he strode into the palace and commanded a feast to be prepared a feast worthy of an occasion so magnificent but when midas with the healthy appetite of the peasant born would have eaten largely of the savory food that his cooks prepared he found that his teeth only touched roast kid to turn it into a slab of gold that garlic lost its flavor and became gritty as he chewed that rice turned into golden grains and curdled milk became a dower fit for a princess entirely unnegotiable for the digestion of man baffled and miserable midas seized his cup of wine but the red wine had become one with the golden vessel that held it nor could he quench his thirst for even the limpid water from the fountain was melted gold when it touched his dry lips only for a very few days was midas able to bear the affliction of his wealth there was nothing now for him to live for he could buy the whole earth if he pleased but even children shrank in terror from his touch and hungry and thirsty and sick at heart he wearily dragged along his weighty robes of gold gold was power he knew well yet of what worth was gold while he starved gold could not buy him life and health and happiness in despair at length he cried to the god who had given him the gift that he hated save me o bacchus he said a witless one am i and the folly of my desire has been my undoing take away from me the accursed golden touch and faithfully and well shall i serve thee for ever then bacchus very pitiful for him told midas to go to sardis the chief city of his worshippers and to trace to its source the river upon which it was built and in that pool when he found it he was to plunge his head and so he would for evermore be freed from the golden touch it was a long journey that midas then took and a weary and a starving man was he when at length he reached the spring where the river pactolus had its source he crawled forward and timidly plunged in his head and shoulders almost he expected to feel the harsh grit of golden water but instead there was the joy he had known as a peasant boy when he laved his face and drank at a cool spring when his day's toil was ended and when he raised his face from the pool he knew that his hateful power had passed from him but under the water he saw grains of gold glittering in the sand and from that time forth the river pactolus was noted for its gold one lesson the peasant king had learnt by paying in suffering for a mistake but there was yet more suffering in store for the tragic comedian he had now no wish for golden riches nor even for power he wished to lead the simple life and to listen to the pipings of pan along with the goat herds on the mountains or the wild creatures in the woods thus it befell that he was present one day at a contest between pan and apollo himself it was a day of merrymaking for nymphs and fauns and dryads and all those who lived in the lonely solitudes of phrygia came to listen to the music of the god who ruled them for as pan sat in the shade of a forest one night and piped on his reeds until the very shadows danced and the water of the stream by which he sat leapt high over the mossy stones it passed and laughed aloud in its glee the god had so gloried in his own power that he cried who speaks of apollo and his lyre some of the gods may be well pleased with his music and may hap a bloodless man or two but my music strikes to the heart of the earth itself it stirs with rapture the very sap of the trees and awakes to life and joy the innermost soul of all things mortal apollo heard his boast and heard it angrily oh thou whose soul is the soul of the untilled ground he said wouldst thou place thy music that is like the wind in the reeds beside my music which is as the music of the spheres and pan splashing with his goat's feet amongst the water lilies of the stream on the bank of which he sat laughed loudly and cried yea would i apollo willingly would i play thee a match thou on thy golden lyre i on my reeds from the river 
thus did it come to pass that apollo and pan matched against each other their music and king midas was one of the judges first of all pan took his fragile reeds and as he played the leaves on the trees shivered and the sleeping lilies raised their heads and the birds ceased their song to listen and then flew straight to their mates and all the beauty of the world grew more beautiful and all its terror grew yet more grim and still pan piped on and laughed to see the nymphs and the fauns first dance in joyousness and then tremble in fear and the buds to blossom and the stags to bellow in their lordship of the hills when he ceased it was as though a tensely drawn string had broken and all the earth lay breathless and mute and pan turned proudly to the golden-haired god who had listened as he had spoken through the hearts of reeds to the hearts of men canst then make music like unto my music apollo he said then apollo his purple robes barely hiding the perfection of his limbs a wreath of laurel crowning his yellow curls looked down at pan from his godlike height and smiled in silence for a moment his hand silently played over the golden strings of his lyre and then his fingertips gently touched them and every creature there who had a soul felt that that soul had wings and the wings sped them straight to olympus far away from all earth-bound creatures they flew and dwelt in magnificent serenity amongst the immortals no longer was there strife or any dispeace no more was there fierce warring between the actual and the unknown the green fields and thick woods had faded into nothingness and their creatures and the fair nymphs and dryads and the wild fauns and centaurs longed and fought no more and man had ceased to desire the impossible throbbing nature and passionately desiring life faded into dust before the melody that apollo called forth and when his strings had ceased to quiver and only the faintly remembered echo of his music remained it was as though the earth had passed away and all things had become new for the space of many seconds all was silence then in low voice apollo asked ye who listen who is the victor and earth and sea and sky and all the creatures of earth and sky and of the deep replied as one the victory is thine divine apollo yet was there one dissentient voice midas sorely puzzled utterly ununderstanding was relieved when the music of apollo ceased if only pan would play again he murmured to himself i wish to live and pan's music gives me life i love the woolly vine buds and the fragrant pine leaves and the scent of the violets in the spring the smell of the fresh ploughed earth is dear to me the breath of the kind that have grazed in the meadows of wild parsley and of asphodel i want to drink red wine and to eat and love and fight and work and be joyous and sad fierce and strong and very weary and to sleep the dead sleep of men who live only as weak mortals do therefore he raised his voice and called very loud pan's music is sweeter and truer and greater than the music of apollo pan is the victor and i king midas give him the victor's crown with scorn ineffable the sun-god turned upon midas his peasant's face transfigured by his proud decision for a little he gazed at him in silence and his look might have turned a sunbeam to an icicle then he spoke the ears of an ass have heard my music he said henceforth shall midas have ass's ears and when midas in terror clapped his hands to his crisp black hair he found growing far beyond it the long pointed ears of an ass perhaps what hurt him most as he fled away was the shout of merriment that came from pan and fauns and nymphs and satyrs echoed that shout most joyously willingly would he have hidden in the woods but there he found no hiding place the trees and shrubs and flowering things seemed to shake in cruel mockery 
back to his court he went and sent for the court hairdresser that he might bribe him to devise a covering for these long peaked hairy symbols of his folly gladly the hairdresser accepted many and many oboli many and many golden gifts and all phrygia wondered while it copied the strange headdress of the king but although much gold had bought his silence the court barber was unquiet of heart all day and all through the night he was tormented by his weighty secret and then at length silence was to him a torture too great to be borne he sought a lonely place there dug a deep hole and kneeling by it softly whispered to the damp earth king midas has ass's ears greatly relieved he hastened home and was well content until on the spot where his secret lay buried rushes grew up and when the winds blew through them the rushes whispered for all those who passed by to hear king midas has ass's ears king midas has ass's ears those who listen very carefully to what the green rushes in marshy places whisper as the wind passes through them may hear the same thing to this day and those who hear the whisper of the rushes may perhaps give a pitying thought to midas the tragic comedian of mythology end of king midas of the golden touch recording by james k white chula vista section seventeen of a book of myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by james k white chula vista a book of myths by jean lang section seventeen saix and halcyone st martin's summer halcyon days king henry the sixth act one scene two line one thirty one halcyon days how often is the expression made use of how seldom do its users realize from whence they have borrowed it these were halcyon days says the old man and his memory wanders back to a time when for him all the world is young lad and all the trees are green and every goose a swan lad and every lass a queen yet the story of halcyone is one best to be understood by the heavy-hearted woman who wanders along the bleak sea beach and strains her weary eyes for the brown sail of the fishing boat that will never more return over the kingdom of thessaly in the days of long ago there reigned a king whose name was saix son of hesperus the day star and almost as radiant in grace and beauty as was his father his wife was the fair halcyone daughter of aeolus ruler of the winds and most perfectly did this king and queen love one another their happiness was unmarred until there came a day when saix had to mourn for the loss of a brother following close on the heels of this disaster came direful prodigies which led saix to fear that in some way he must have incurred the hostility of the gods to him there was no way in which to discover wherein lay his fault and to make atonement for it but by going to consult the oracle of apollo at claros in ionia when he told halcyone what he must do she knew well that she must not try to turn him from his solemn purpose yet there hung over her heart a black shadow of fear and of evil foreboding that no loving words of assurance could drive away most piteously she begged him to take her with him but the king knew too well the dangers of the treacherous aegean sea to risk on it the life of the woman that he loved so well i promise he said by the rays of my father the day star that if fate permits i will return before the moon shall have twice rounded her orb down by the shore the sailors of king saix awaited his coming and when with passionately tender love he and halcyone had taken farewell of each other the rowers sat down on the benches and dipped their long oars into the water 
with rhythmic swing they drove the great ship over the grey sea while ceyx stood on deck and gazed back at his wife until his eyes could no longer distinguish her from the rocks on the shore nor could she any longer see the white sails of the ship as it crested the restless waves heavier still was her heart when she turned away from the shore and yet more heavy it grew as the day wore on and dark night descended for the air was full of the clamorous wailings of the fierce winds whose joy it is to lash the waves into rage and to strew with dead men and broken timber the angry surf-beaten shore my king she sighed to herself my king my own and through the weary hours she prayed to the gods to bring him safely back to her and many times she offered fragrant incense to juno protectress of women that she might have pity on a woman whose husband and true lover was out in the storm a plaything for ruthless winds and waves a helpless plaything was the king of thessaly long ere the dim evening light had made of the shore of his own land a faint gray line the white-maned horses of poseidon king of the seas began to rear their heads and as night fell a black curtain blotting out every landmark and all home-like things the east wind rushed across the aegean sea smiting the seahorses into madness seizing the sails with cruel grasp and casting them in tatters before it snapping the mast as though it were but a dry reed by the river before so mighty a tempest no oars could be of any avail and for a little time only the winds and waves gambled like a half-sated wolf-pack over their helpless prey with hungry roar the great weight of black water stove in the deck and swept the sailors out of the ship to choke them in its icy depths and ever it would lift the wounded thing high up on its foaming white crests as though to toss it to the dark sky and ever again would suck it down into the blackness while the shrieking winds drove it onward with howling taunts and mocking laughter while life stayed in him ceyx thought only of halcyone he had no fear only the fear of the grief his death must bring to her who loved him as he loved her his peerless queen his halcyone his prayers to the gods were prayers for her for himself he asked one thing only that the waves might bear his body to her sight so that her gentle hands might lay him in his tomb with shout of triumph that they had slain a king winds and waves seized him even as he prayed and the day star that was hidden behind the black pall of the sky knew that his son a brave king and faithful lover had gone down to the shades when dawn the rosy-fingered had come to thessaly halcyone white-faced and tired-eyed anxiously watched the sea that was still tossing in half-savage mood eagerly she gazed at the place where last the white sail had been seen was it not possible that ceyx having weathered the gale might for the present have foregone his voyage to ionia and was returning to her to bring peace to her heart but the sea beach was strewn with wrack and the winds still blew bits of tattered surf along the shore and for her there was only the heavy labor of waiting of waiting and of watching for the ship that never came the incense from her altars blew out in heavy sweetness to meet the bitter-sweet tang of the seaweed that was carried in by the tide for halcyone prayed on fearful yet hoping that her prayers might still keep safe her man her king her lover she busied herself in laying out the garments he would wear on his return and in choosing the clothes in which she might be fairest in his eyes this robe as blue as the sky in spring silver bordered as the sea in kind mood is bordered with a feathery silver fringe she could recall just how ceyx looked when first he saw her wear it she could hear his very tones as he told her that of all queens she was the peeress of all women the most beautiful of all wives the most dear almost she forgot the horrors of the night so certain did it seem that his dear voice must soon again tell her the words that have been love's litany since ever time began in the ears of juno 
those petitions for him whose dead body was even then being tossed hither and thither by the restless waves his murderers came at last to be more than even she could bear she gave command to her handmaiden iris to go to the palace of somnus god of sleep and brother of death and to bid him send to halcyone a vision in the form of ceyx to tell her that all her weary waiting was in vain in a valley among the black cimmerian mountains the death god somnus had his abode in her rainbow hued robes iris darted through the sky at her mistress's bidding tinging as she sped through them the clouds that she passed it was a silent valley that she reached at last here the sun never came nor was there ever any sound to break the silence from the ground the noiseless grey clouds whose work it is to hide the sun and moon rose softly and rolled away up to the mountain tops and down to the lowest valleys to work the will of the gods all around the cave lurked the long dark shadows that bring fear to the heart of children and that at nightfall hasten the steps of the timid wayfarer no noise was there but from far down the valley there came a murmur so faint and so infinitely soothing that it was less a sound than of a lullaby remembered in dreams for past the valley of sleep flow the waters of leith the river of forgetfulness close up to the door of the cave where dwelt the twin brothers sleep and death blood-red poppies grew and at the door itself stood shadowy forms their fingers on their lips enjoining silence on all those who would enter in amareth crowned and softly waving sheaves of poppies that bring dreams from which there is no awakening there was there no gate with hinges to creak or bars to clang and into the stilly darkness iris walked unhindered from outer cave to inner cave she went and each cave she left behind was less dark than the one that she entered in the innermost room of all on an ebony couch draped with sable curtains the god of sleep lay drowsing his garments were black strewn with golden stars a wreath of half-opened poppies crowned his sleepy head and he leaned on the strong shoulder of morpheus his favorite son all round his bed hovered pleasant dreams gently stooping over him to whisper their messages like a field of wheat swayed by the breeze or willows that bow their silver heads and murmur to each other the secrets that no one ever knows brushing the idle dreams aside as a ray of sunshine brushes away the gray wisps of mist that hang to the hillside iris walked up to the couch where somnus lay the light from her rainbow-hued robe lit up the darkness of the cave yet somnus lazily only half opened his eyes moved his head so that it rested more easily and in a sleepy voice asked of her what might be her errand somnus she said gentlest of gods tranquilizer of minds and soother of careworn hearts juno sends you her commands that you dispatch a dream to halcyone in the city of trachine representing her lost husband and all the events of the wreck her message delivered iris hastened away for it seemed to her that already her eyelids grew heavy and that there were creeping upon her limbs throwing silver dust in her eyes lulling into peaceful slumber her mind those sprites born of the blood-red poppies that bring to weary mortals rest and sweet forgetfulness only rousing himself sufficiently to give his orders somnus entrusted to morpheus the task imposed upon him by juno and then with a yawn turned over on his downy pillow and gave himself up to exquisite slumber when he had winged his way to trachine morpheus took upon himself the form of ceyx and sought the room where halcyone slept she had watched the far horizon many hours that day for many an hour had she vainly burned incense to the gods tired in heart and soul in body and in mind she laid herself down on her couch at last hoping for the gift of sleep not long had she slept in the dead still sleep that weariness and a stricken heart bring with them when morpheus came and stood by her side he was only a dream yet his face was the face of ceyx 
not the radiant beautiful son of the day star was the saix who stood by her now and gazed on her with piteous pitying dead eyes his clothing dripped sea water in his hair was tangled the weed of the sea uprooted by the storm pale pale was his face and his white hands gripped the stones and sand that had failed him in his dying agony halcyone whimpered in her sleep as she looked on him and morpheus stooped over her and spoke the words that he had been told to say i am thy husband saix halcyone no more do prayers and the blue curling smoke of incense avail me dead am i slain by the storm and the waves on my dead white face the skies look down and the restless sea tosses my chill body that still seeks thee seeking a haven in thy dear arms seeking rest on thy warm loving heart with a cry halcyone started up but morpheus had fled and there were no wet footprints or drops of sea-water on the floor marking as she had hoped the way that her lord had taken not again did sleep visit her that night a grey cold morning dawned and found her on the seashore as ever her eyes sought the far horizon but no white sail a messenger of hope was there to greet her yet surely she saw something a black speck like a ship driven on by the long oars of mariners who knew well the path to home through the watery ways from far away in the grey it hasted towards her and then there came to halcyone the knowledge that no ship was this thing but a lifeless body swept onwards by the hurrying waves nearer and nearer it came until at length she could recognize the form of this flotsam and jetsam of the sea with heart that broke as she uttered the words she stretched out her arms and cried aloud o oh, saix my beloved is it thus that thou returnest to me to break the fierce assaults of sea and of storm there had been built out from the shore a mole and on to this barrier leapt the distraught halcyone she ran along it and when the dead white body of the man she loved was still out of reach she prayed her last prayer a wordless prayer of anguish to the gods only let me get near him she breathed grant only that i nestle close against his dear breast let me show him that living or dead i am his and he mine forever and to halcyone a great miracle was then vouchsafed for from out of her snowy shoulders grew snow-white pinions and with them she skimmed over the waves until she reached the rigid body of saix drifting a helpless burden for the conquering waves in with the swift flowing tide as she flew she uttered cries of love and of longing but only strange raucous cries came from the throat that had once only made music and when she reached the body of saix and would fain have kissed his marble lips halcyone found that no longer were her own lips like the petals of a fair red rose warmed by the sun for the gods had heard her prayer and her horny beak seemed to the watchers on the shore to be fiercely tearing at the face of him who had been king of thessaly yet the gods were not merciless or perhaps the love of halcyone was an all-conquering love for as the soul of halcyone had passed into the body of a white-winged sea-bird so also passed the soul of her husband the king and forevermore halcyone and her mate known as the halcyon birds defied the storm and tempest and proudly breasted side by side the angriest waves of the raging sea to them too did the gods grant a boon that for seven days before the shortest day of the year and for seven days after it there should reign over the sea a great calm in which halcyone in her floating nest should hatch her young and to those days of calm and sunshine the name of the halcyon days was given and still as a storm approaches the white-winged birds come flying inland with shrill cries of warning to the mariners whose ships they pass in their flight 
Saix, they cry. Remember Saix. And hastily the fishermen fill their sails, and the smacks drive homeward to the haven where the blue smoke curls upwards from the chimneys of their homesteads, and where the red poppies are nodding sleepily amongst the yellow corn. Note. The kingfisher is commonly known as the real halcyon bird. Of it, Socrates says, The bird is not great, but it has received great honor from the gods because of its lovingness. For while it is making its nest, all the world has the happy days which it calls Halcyonidae, excelling all others in their calmness. End of Saix and Halcyone Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Section 18 of A Book of Myths This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. A Book of Myths by Jean Lang. Section 18. Aristius the Beekeeper. Every sound is sweet. Myriads of rivers hurrying through the lawn, the moan of doves in immemorial elms, and murmuring of innumerable bees. Tennyson In the fragrance of the blossom of the limes, the bees are gleaning a luscious harvest. Their busy humming sounds like the surf on a reef heard from very far away, and would almost lull to sleep those who lazily, drowsily spend the sunny summer afternoon in the shadow of the trees. That line of beehives by the sweet pea hedge shows where they store their treasure that men may rob them of it. But out on the uplands, where the heather is purple, the wild bees hum in and out of the honey-laden bells and carry home their spoils to their own free fastnesses from which none can drive them unless there comes a foray against them from the brown men of the moors. How many of us who watch their ardent labors know the story of Aristius, he who first brought the art of beekeeping to perfection in his own dear land of Greece, and whose followers are those men in veils of blue and green, that motley throng who beat fire irons and create a hideous clamor in order that the queen bee and her excited followers may be checked in their perilous voyagings and beguiled to swarm in the sanctuary of a hive. Aristius was a shepherd, the son of Cyrene, a water nymph, and to him there had come one day, as he listened to the wild bees humming amongst the wild thyme, the great thought that he might conquer these busy workers and make their toil his gain. He knew that hollow trees or a hole in a rock were used as the storage houses of their treasure, and so the wily shepherd lad provided for them the homes he knew that they would covet and near them placed all the food that they most desired. Soon Aristius became noted as a tamer of bees, and even in Olympus they spoke of his honey as a thing that was food for the gods. All might have gone well with Aristius, had there not come for him the fateful day when he saw the beautiful Eurydice, and to her lost his heart. She fled before the fiery protestations of his love, and trod upon the serpent whose bite brought her down to the shades. The gods were angry with Aristius, and as punishment they slew his bees. His hives stood empty and silent, and no more did the murmuring of innumerable bees drowse the ears of the herds who watched their flocks cropping the red clover and the asphodel of the meadows. Underneath the swift-flowing water of a deep river, the nymph who was the mother of Aristius sat on her throne. Fishes darted round her white feet, and beside her sat her attendants spinning the fine strong green cords that twine themselves round the throats of those who perish when their arms can no longer fight against the force of the rushing current. A nymph sang as she worked, an old, old song that told one of the old, old tales of man's weakness 
and the power of the creatures of water but above her song those who listened heard a man's voice calling loudly and pitifully the voice was that of aristius calling aloud for his mother then his mother gave command and the waters of the river rolled asunder and let aristius pass down far below to where the fountains of the great rivers lie a mighty roar of many waters dinned in his ears as the rivers started on the race that was to bring them all at last to their restless haven the ocean to cyrene he came at length and to her told his sorrowful tale to men who live their little lives and work and die as i myself though son of a nymph and of a god must do he said i have brought two great gifts o oh my mother i have taught them that from the grey olives they can reap a priceless harvest and from me they have learned that the little brown bees that hum in and out of the flowers may be made slaves that bring to them the sweetest riches of which nature may be robbed this do i already know my son said cyrene and smiled upon aristius yet dost thou not know said aristius the doom that has overtaken my army of busy workers no longer does there come from my city of bees the boom of many wings and many busy little feet as they fly swift and strong hither and thither to bring back to the hives their honeyed treasure the comb is empty the bees are all dead or if not dead they have forsaken me forever then spoke cyrene hast heard my son she said of proteus it is he who herds the flocks of the boundless sea on days when the south wind and the north wind wrestle together and when the wind from the east smites the west wind in shame before him thou mayest see him raise his snowy head and long white beard above the grey-green waves of the sea and lash the white-maned unbridled fierce sea-horses into fury before him proteus only none but proteus can tell thee by what art thou canst win thy bees back once more then aristius with eagerness questioned his mother how he might find proteus and gain from him the knowledge that he sought and cyrene answered no matter how piteously thou dost entreat him never save by force wilt thou gain his secret from proteus only if thou canst chain him by guile as he sleeps and hold fast the chains undaunted by the shapes into which he has the power to change himself wilt thou win his knowledge from him then cyrene sprinkled her son with the nectar of the deathless gods and in his heart there was born a noble courage and through him a new life seemed to run lead me now to proteus o oh my mother he said and cyrene left her throne and led him to the cave where proteus herdsman of the seas had his dwelling behind the seaweed covered rocks aristius concealed himself while the nymph used the fleecy clouds for her covering and when apollo drove his chariot across the high heavens at noon and all land and all sea were hot as molten gold proteus with his flocks returned to the shade of his great cave by the sobbing sea and on its sandy floor he stretched himself and soon lay his limbs all lax and restful in the exquisite joy of a dreamless sleep from behind the rocks aristius watched him and when at length he saw that proteus slept too soundly to wake gently he stepped forward and on the sleep drowsed limbs of proteus fixed the fetters that made him his captive then in joy and pride at having been the undoing of the shepherd of the seas aristius shouted aloud and proteus awaking swiftly turned himself into a wild boar with white tusks that lusted to thrust themselves into the thighs of aristius but aristius unflinching kept his firm hold of the chain next did he become a tiger tawny and velvet black and fierce to devour and still aristius held the chain and never let his eye fall before the glare of the beast that sought to devour him 
a scaly dragon came next breathing out flames and yet aristius held him then came a lion its yellow pelt scented with the lust of killing and while aristius yet strove against him there came to terrify his listening ears the sound of fire that lapped up and thirstily devoured all things that would stand against it and ere the crackle of the flames and their great sigh of fierce desire had ceased there came in his ears the sound of many waters the booming rush of an angry river in furious flood the irresistible command of the almighty waves of the sea yet still aristius held the chains and at last proteus took his own shape again and with a sigh like the sigh of winds and waves on the desolate places where ships become wrecks and men perish and there is never a human soul to save or to pity them he spoke to aristius puny one he said and puny are thy wishes because thou didst by thy foolish wooing send the beautiful eurydice swiftly down to the shades and break the heart of orpheus whose music is the music of the immortals the bees that thou hast treasured have left their hives empty and silent so little are the bees so great o aristius the bliss or woe of orpheus and eurydice yet because by guile thou hast won the power to gain from me the knowledge that thou dost seek hearken to me now aristius four bulls must thou find four cows of equal beauty then must thou build in a leafy grove four altars and to orpheus and eurydice pay such funeral honours as may allay their resentment at the end of nine days when thou hast fulfilled thy pious task return and see what the gods have sent thee this will i do most faithfully o proteus said aristius and gravely loosened the chains and returned to where his mother awaited him and thence travelled to his own sunny land of greece most faithfully as he had said did aristius perform his vow and when on the ninth day he returned to the grove of sacrifice a sound greeted him which made his heart stop and then go on beating and throbbing as the heart of a man who has striven valiantly in a great fight and to whom the battle is assured for from the carcass of one of the animals offered for sacrifice and whose clean white bones now gleamed in the rays of the sun that forced its way through the thick shade of the grove of grey olives there came the murmuring of innumerable bees out of the eater came forth meat out of the strong came forth sweetness and aristius a samson of the old greek days rejoiced exceedingly knowing that his thoughtless sin was pardoned and that for evermore to him belonged the pride of giving to all men the power of taming bees the glory of mastering the little brown creatures that pillage from the fragrant bright-hued flowers their most precious treasure end of aristius the beekeeper recording by james k white chula vista section 19 of a book of myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by james k white chula vista a book of myths by jean lang section 19 proserpine sacred goddess mother earth thou from whose immortal bosom gods and men and beasts have birth leaf and blade and bud and blossom breathe thine influence most divine on thine own child proserpine if with mists of evening dew thou dost nourish those young flowers till they grow in scent and hue fairest children of the hours breathe thine influence most divine on thine own child proserpine shelley the story of persephone or proserpine is a story of spring when the sun is warming the bare brown earth 
and the pale primroses look up through the snowy blackthorns at a kind blue sky almost can we hear the soft wind murmur a name as it gently sways the daffodils and breathes through the honey sweetness of the gold powdered catkins on the grey willows by the river persephone persephone now once there was a time when there was no spring neither summer nor autumn nor chilly winter with its black frosts and cruel gales and brief dark days always was there sunshine and warmth ever were there flowers and corn and fruit and nowhere did the flowers grow with more dazzling colours and more fragrant perfume than in the fair garden of sicily to demeter the earth mother was born a daughter more fair than any flower that grew and ever more dear to her became her child the lovely proserpine by the blue sea in the sicilian meadows proserpine and the fair nymphs who were her companions spent their happy days too short were the days for all their joy and demeter made the earth yet fairer than it was that she might bring more gladness to her daughter proserpine each day the blossoms that the nymphs twined into garlands grew more perfect in form and in hue but from the anemones of royal purple and crimson and the riotous red of geraniums proserpine turned one morning with a cry of gladness for there stood before her beside a little stream on one erect slim stem a wonderful narcissus with a hundred blossoms her eager hand was stretched out to pluck it when a sudden black cloud overshadowed the land and the nymphs with shrieks of fear fled swiftly away and as the cloud descended there was heard a terrible sound as of the rushing of many waters or the roll of the heavy wheels of the chariot of one who comes to slay then was the earth cleft open and from it there arose the four coal-black horses of pluto neighing aloud in their eagerness while the dark-browed god urged them on standing erect in his car of gold the coal-black horses rise they rise o oh mother mother lo she cries persephone persephone o oh, light 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 she cries farewell the coal-black horses wait for me o oh, shade of shades where i must dwell demeter mother far from thee in cold strong arms pluto seized her in that mighty grasp that will not be denied and proserpine wept childish tears as she shivered at his icy touch and sobbed because she had dropped the flowers she had picked and had never picked the flower she most desired while still she saw the fair light of day the little oddly shaped rocky hills the vineyards and olive groves and flowery meadows of sicily she did not lose hope surely the king of terrors could not steal one so young so happy and so fair she had only tasted the joy of living and fain she would drink deeper in the coming years her mother must surely save her her mother who had never yet failed her her mother and the gods but ruthless as the mower whose scythe cuts down the seeded grass and the half-opened flower and lays them in swaths on the meadow pluto drove on his iron-coloured reins were loose on the black manes of his horses and he urged them forward by name till the froth flew from their mouths like the foam that the furious surf of the sea drives before it in a storm across the bay and along the bank of the river anapus they galloped until at the river head they came to the pool of cyane he smote the water with his trident and downward into the blackness of darkness his horses passed and proserpine knew no more the pleasant light of day what ails her that she comes not home demeter seeks her far and wide and gloomy browed doth ceaseless roam from many a morn till eventide my life immortal though it be is naught she cries for want of thee persephone persephone 
so to the great mother earth came the pangs that have drawn tears of blood from many a mortal mother's heart for a child born off to the shades my life is not for want of thee persephone persephone the cry is borne down through the ages to echo and re-echo so long as mother's love and death is still unchained over land and sea from where dawn the rosy-fingered rises in the east to where apollo cools the fiery wheels of his chariot in the waters of far western seas the goddess sought her daughter with a black robe over her head and carrying a flaming torch in either hand for nine dreary days she sought her loved one and yet for nine more weary days and nine sleepless nights the goddess racked by human sorrow sat in hopeless misery the hot sun beat upon her by day by night the silver rays from diana's car smote her more gently and the dew drenched her hair and her black garments and mingled with the saltness of her bitter tears at the grey dawning of the tenth day her elder daughter hecate stood beside her queen of ghosts and shades was she and to her all dark places of the earth were known let us go to the sun god said hecate surely he hath seen the god who stole away the little proserpine soon his chariot will drive across the heavens come let us ask him to guide us to the place where she is hidden thus did they come to the chariot of the glorious apollo and standing by the heads of his horses like two grey clouds that bar the passage of the sun they begged him to tell them the name of him who had stolen fair proserpine no less a thief was he said apollo than pluto king of darkness and robber of life itself mourn not demeter thy daughter is safe in his keeping the little nymph who played in the meadows is now queen of the shades nor does pluto love her vainly she is now in love with death no comfort did the words of the sun god bring to the longing soul of demeter and her wounded heart grew bitter because she suffered others must suffer as well because she mourned all the world must mourn the fragrant flowers spoke to her only of persephone the purple grapes reminded her of a vintage when the white fingers of her child had plucked the fruit the waving golden grain told her that persephone was as an ear of wheat that is reaped before its time then upon the earth did there come dearth and drought and barrenness the wheat was blighted in the ear the purple grapes blushed no more on the vines and all the gods were sorrowful lewis morris gods and men alike suffered from the sorrow of demeter to her in pity for the barren earth zeus sent an embassy but in vain it came merciless was the great earth mother who had been robbed of what she held most dear give me back my child she said gladly i watch the sufferings of men for no sorrow is as my sorrow give me back my child and the earth shall grow fertile once more unwillingly zeus granted the request of demeter she shall come back he said at last and with thee dwell on earth for ever yet only on one condition do i grant thy fond request persephone must eat no food through all the time of her sojourn in the realm of pluto else must thy beseeching be all in vain then did demeter gladly leave olympus and hasten down to the darkness of the shadowy land that once again she might hold in her strong mother's arms her who had once been her little clinging child but in the dark kingdom of pluto a strange thing had happened no longer had the pale-faced god with dark locks and eyes like the sunless pools of a mountain stream any terrors for proserpine he was strong and cruel had she thought him yet now she knew that the touch of his strong cold hands was a touch of infinite tenderness when knowing the fiat of the ruler of olympus pluto gave to his stolen bride a pomegranate red in heart as the heart of a man she had taken it from his hand and because he willed it had eaten of the sweet seeds then in truth 
it was too late for demeter to save her child she had eaten of love's seed and changed into another he takes the cleft pomegranate seeds love eat with me this parting day then bids them fetch the coal-black steeds demeter's daughter wouldst away the gates of hades set her free she will return full soon saith he my wife my wife persephone ingelo dark dark was the kingdom of pluto its rivers never mirrored a sunbeam and ever moaned low as an earthly river moans before a coming flood and the feet that trod the gloomy cocytus valley were the feet of those who never again would tread on the soft grass and flowers of an earthly meadow yet when demeter had braved all the shadows of hades only in part was her end accomplished in part only was proserpine now her child for while half her heart was in the sunshine rejoicing in the beauties of earth the other half was with the god who had taken her down to the land of darkness and there had won her for his own back to the flowery island of sicily her mother brought her and the peach trees and the almonds blossomed snowily as she passed the olives decked themselves with their soft gray leaves the corn sprang up green and lush and strong the lemon and orange groves grew golden with luscious fruit and all the land was carpeted with flowers for six months of the year she stayed and gods and men rejoiced at the bringing back of proserpine for six months she left her green and pleasant land for the dark kingdom of him whom she loved and through those months the trees were bare and the earth chill and brown and under the earth the flowers hid themselves in fear and awaited the return of the fair daughter of demeter and evermore has she come and gone and seed time and harvest have never failed and the cold sleeping world has awaked and rejoiced and heralded with the song of birds and the bursting of green buds and the blooming of flowers the resurrection from the dead the coming of spring time calls and change commands both men and gods and speeds us on we know not whither but the old earth smiles spring after spring and the seed bursts again out of its prison mould and the dead lives renew themselves and rise aloft and soar and are transformed clothing themselves with change till the last change be done lewis morris end of proserpine recording by james k white chula vista